think, sir, I'm good to jump up here, like a, just like a jackrabbit. <laughs> well, some of you moved, or did you move back? <laughs> uh, revival services, I failed to make this announcement, are going to be at uh, uh, Shiloh Stamps. Uh, where's the name of that church? Shiloh, Shiloh Union and Stamps. Uh, June uh, the 3rd and 4th. So Monday and Tuesday nights. No, uh, all week long. Okay. I was, uh, Monday and Tuesday night, Ron Owen is preaching. Uh, Wednesday night, Ed Phillips is preaching, and Thursday and Friday night, Jason Goodwin is preaching, and the Daniel, Jack Daniels family will be leading the music uh, all week long. Pastor Lonnie, Lonnie Warren is there now, uh, Shallow Union and Stamps on the week of, Tuesday, week of June 3 through 7, okay? If y'all want to uh, go visit with, uh, with them. Start a series this morning that I uh, asked you to be praying about. What does the Bible say about? And I'd ask that you turn in any uh, thing that maybe had been on your mind, and we'd just we'd just see where this leads to. And we're at about uh, we're up to about seven messages now, I think. And uh, we'll go to about ten if y'all keep turning them in. And and then after that, I think I'm going into First Corinthians, but uh, we'll pray about that, and you pray about that, and we'll see how the, the Lord leads. What does the Bible say about heretics? Kelly and I were sitting watching uh, uh, Family Feud last night, and in keeping with Family Feud, I'll ask you, A hundred church members were surveyed and asked the question, what do you think your pastor will preach on this Sunday? And how many do you think said, he's preaching on heretics? (laughs) And the answer probably would be zero would be the correct answer. And maybe you've read from this little book that we'll read from this morning, and uh, it'll be on the slides, but if you have your Bibles, turn with me to... Romans chapter 16, and it actually, this is one I picked because it comes out of the passage from last Sunday that uh, I didn't get to spend the time on this passage that I wanted to, and so I want uh, us to look at what does the Bible say about heretics. We're not talking about necessarily uh, burning people at the stake this morning, and uh, doing all of those things that happened back years ago, and uh, the Inquisition, many people were were put to death and burned at the stake for even possessing a Bible. So uh, heretics have been around a long time, that term has, and it's a biblical term, and we're going to see that term used this morning. So don't, uh, don't turn your brain off. Uh, you're going you're to see some things this morning worthwhile uh, that the Bible talks about uh, uh, this subject and why I'm addressing it this morning. What does the Bible say about heretics? Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Paul says, now I make one more appeal. If in writing this whole book and he's getting ready for his conclusion, I think we better pay attention to his Uh, Last statement, whether it was planned or not, uh uh-oh, I need to say this one more time. I make one more appeal. My dear brothers and sisters, my brethren, here's my appeal. Here's what you need to be aware of. Watch out, present tense, continually watch out for people who cause divisions. Now, I'm going to read from other texts here in just a moment. This word division is where we also get this word heretic, and you'll see that in a minute, but I want to call your attention to it. That's the subject this morning is where Paul is saying, watch out for those who cause division 
and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary. That's the issue. Teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. So watch out for division, especially in the, in the area of false teaching. Be aware that people are teaching something contrary to what you've been taught. And here's our imperative verb. I, of course, mentioned this last week in passing, but our imperative verb is, and stay away from them. Get away from them. Don't stay around people who are teaching false doctrine, who are using the Word of God contrary to the beliefs that I've been teaching you. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They are serving their own personal interest. This is an extremely intuitive statement. Of course, we would expect that of the Holy Spirit of God. But divisions are caused by people who want their own way, right? Any division would be somebody has a, a right, uh, uh, somebody has a standard, somebody has uh, the way we've always done it, if you, if you will, but it's the standard, and somebody else says, no, I think we ought to do this or that or something different and Paul is saying when it comes to the word of God I want you to watch watch out for those people and they're teaching things contrary to what you've been taught because they're not trying to serve Christ our Lord they're trying to serve themselves they have their own personal agenda their own interest at heart and you just stay away from them Look at 2 John now, verse 10. 2 John 10 and 11. John says, anyone, or if anyone, comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So he's pretty uh, serious about this issue of correct doctrine and not even receiving someone and even saying hello to them if you know that they are promoting false doctrine. Paul writing to Timothy. We'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I urged you, and he's talking to Timothy, as I urged you, Timothy, upon my departure from Ma for Macedonia, and we've talked about that some, that he, uh, that's over near Corinth, that's in Greece. I urged you upon my departure for Greece, for Macedonia, where he ended up writing the book of Romans in Corinth. Remain on at Ephesus in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and, geni and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction, here's the goal, the goal of our instruction, the goal of our doctrine is love from a pure heart, and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussions. We look at Jude. Jude, of course, is just one chapter. Jude, verse 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, in other words, Jude had one thing on his heart and mind. He wanted to write to them about uh, their salvation. I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, 
those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn, Paul talked about this, who turn the grace of our God into into licentiousness, license to do anything. Paul talked about it. God forbid that you would take the grace of God, that you've been washed in the blood, that you've been eternally secure, that you've, uh, you no longer uh, are condemned, that you would take the grace of God and, and turn that around and, and think you had license to do whatever you wanted to do. Ungodly persons who take the grace of our God and turn it and, and, uh, into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the biggie that uh, that's the greatest heresy of all is that uh, when different groups, and I want to mention those in just a moment, where they don't hold Jesus up as the incarnate Son of God, the one who was deity and became flesh, the 100% God and the 100% man. Now look at what Peter says in 2 Peter 2. And Peter is uh, helping us understand something just in passing. He says, there were false prophets in Israel, but there be false teachers among you. He didn't call them modern day prophets. He called them teachers. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. And they will cleverly teach destructive heresies. There's our word. That's where it comes from. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies. And even deny the master who, brought, who bought them. And in this way they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers... The way of the truth will be slander. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. Reading from the New Living Translation in this passage, that's exactly what we see in our day and age today. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. The last verse that we'll read in the context of of division and and heresy is Paul writing to Titus. And here he says, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So that goes right back to what uh, uh, was it Paul had said earlier, uh, just to reject them, just stay away from them, keep away from them. Don't just kick them out the first time you hear something, but go to them and teach them. You know, what we talked last week about the fact that Priscilla and Aquila had to go to Apollos at one point in time. Paul had to go to Peter at one point in time, which stood him to his face, Scripture says, over the issue of circumcision. So there are times when somebody uh, that just doesn't know uh, might say something, and you go to him and say, brother, do you know just exactly what you just said and what the, how, how that would play out? And, and that's not biblical. And if they hear you, then you've gained a brother. If not, Jesus said, take a brother and go with you when he was talking about this in the book of Matthew. But you go to him to the, to the second time and talk with him about what it is that, that uh, uh, you think is unbiblical. And if you can regain that brother, then and you've regained a brother, but if not, you reject him, a man that is a heretic. And then uh, got four verses just uh, that we'll look at together so that you can see how the different versions treated this same verse. So here's that same verse, Titus 3.10. We just read it from the King James Version because King James is the only one who translated it heretic. The others, well, as you see, the top verse there is from King James, KJV, and a a man that is a a heretic, where we get the word. And then the New American Standard is reject a factuous 
man, a man that causes division. And New King James that I normally read from says reject a divisive man. And then the New Living Translation says, and that's more, uh, of course, a modern translation and I think easily defines what the word means and, and, and this is a good explanation of that verse. If anyone is causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning and after that, have nothing more to do with that person. Next slide, Kelly. The word actually means just what you saw in those four different translations. Those four different translations uh, correctly give us the, the definition, and I've told you before that to read from different translations is like having a commentary because any translation had many people, many editors, and they often struggled over how to translate a word uh, the word actually means to be divisive, and it's translated in King James as a heretic, factuous, or divisions. And the Greek word heretic is heretikton, heretikton, so you hear the heretic in that word. So it's actually, and that's why King James is the only one that translated it that way. Back in 1611, the church had such an issue with heretics that the King James translators didn't translate it. They transliterated it. They brought the sound of the word over. And that's what you see there. Heretikton was simply called a heretic. But a heretic is one who causes divisions, who teaches something contrary to what Scripture says. But the very root of heretikton, the very root of what's at stake here is what Paul talked about in his verse in chapter 16 when I said it's such an intuitive statement about what the, what the whole subject is about. Divisiveness comes about when you choose for yourself. So whatever the standard is, the standard could be any, anything dealing with any subject. It, it doesn't have to just be biblical and spiritual. But whatever it is, the standard and the standard of truth for whatever it is you're talking about, and someone else comes in and says, no, that's not my truth. No, I don't agree with that. No, we're going to do something else. That person then becomes a heretic to whatever that truth is. So that's all the word. That's the basic meaning of the word. But then when Paul uses it and brings it into to biblical use, then the heretic is, of course, about contrary doctrine than what he's taught. All through the Middle Ages, when the uh, Catholic Church was involved with the in, uh, Inquisitions and people were being put to death, people that just owned the Bible were put to death. People that just disagreed with anything the church uh, promoted as being truth were branded heretic and put to death, when in reality... The church itself had become heretical, had become uh, the heretic itself because the church had departed from what uh, uh, the basic understanding of Scripture was all about. So obviously, whatever or whoever the authority that's in, that's in authority at the time, they set the, quote, dog, dogma. And if you then disagree with the dogma, the truth, then you're branded the heretic and then persecuted as such. And so we see that uh, this word got used uh, all through history. And I didn't realize what a subject this was. I just was uh, drawn to what Paul was saying in chapter 16 about uh, those that cause division. And this, this is the subject that has plagued the church since the beginning. I mean, you look at all the writers through the first, second, third century. You look at all the, the councils and the creeds and everything that's come down through the, through the ages to us, and it's always been about orthodoxy, that which is we believe the standard, the truth, and those that deviate from it to which we get Jehovah's Witness and, and Mormons and the like today. And so 
Paul wants us to know and wants us to adhere to the doctrine that he's presented and anything contrary to that, you just run away from. You just get away from that altogether. And so Paul said, anything that someone is teaching contrary to what you've already been taught, you run away from. Because what's at stake is what Paul tells Timothy in Timothy chapter 3, where he says all scripture is breathed out by God. So the, the scriptures are at stake. So if you have orthodoxy, you have dogma, you have the truth, and then when someone else comes in and says, that's not my truth, then somebody is not agreeing with the scriptures that the scriptures are authoritative and that the scriptures are inerrant and that the scriptures are God-breathed from God. Somebody then is taking it upon themselves, as Paul said, to serve their own interest. And I don't see it that way, so we're going to do it this other way. So what are some of the heresies that we need to be aware of? And the, and the two big ones in our day is Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness because you see them in our society. You see them down the street. And both Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness are heresies because they do not believe that Jesus was ever all man and all God. The Watchtower, and I read a publication one time that the Watchtower, the Jehovah's Witness put out, that said to grow in to being a good follower of Jehovah's Witness, one must read, and that's the way they put it, one must read the Watchtower and the King James Version of the Bible to get a good understanding of, of uh, what we believe. But the best way to get an understanding of what we believe is to read the Watchtower only. In other words, kick the Bible out and just read what we've written. John chapter 1 in the Watchtower starts out, John 1 and 1. See if you can find the difference. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's the first verse in the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower. One article, one letter, the letter A, condemns their whole system of thought. Because Jesus Christ is not a God. He is God. And so it's heretical, that's the term, it's heresy to teach and preach otherwise. A guy by the name of Aaron, Aaron of Manchester, I think, but that's off the top of my head, Aaron, and became known with his theology was Aaronism. And Aaronism started in the 3rd century, like 250 BC or uh, AD or so, and Aaronism is the exact uh, philosophy that Jehovah's Witness picked up those 1,800 or since 2 to 1,800, 1,600 years later, and Mormonism the same way, the Latter-day Saints. Mormonism will, you know, we, we applaud them to the point of, man, look how they go out and knock on doors and all those young men have to serve. But look what they're serving. Look what they're saying. And God, Jesus Christ is not God. In fact, he, he is a God. But we can all become a God. And, of course, uh, Hinduism, and we get off on other world religions, and, well, they make no bones about being Christian. So they're just, uh, uh, you know, they're just Paganism, we'd call that, not, a, not heresy. Heresy would be something, here's the standard, and we're, we're saying no to that standard. Apostasy, of which the Old Testament talks so, so much about, was here's the standard. Not only are we 
changing from the standard. We're walking away from the standard. To become an apostate means you have left the, uh, the whole teaching that is the standard. I think one writer that I was reading behind one of the commentaries probably, probably hit it right on the head when he said, we don't have much heresy today. And we don't talk much about heresy today because there is no truth today. Everything is relative. It's your truth, but it's not my truth. My truth's my truth, and, and everything's relative, so therefore you can't reject it or you can't walk because you just tolerate it. You just let it go. Whatever's good for you, it suits me if it suits you. But that's not what Scripture says. Paul is saying, teach something contrary to what I've taught you. You walk away from it. Church, one of my greatest jobs is to present the truth to you as best I see it in the Word of God. I like what I read one time. Warren Wiersbe commented about this subject. And he said that uh, this is going on Warren Wiersbe, but I have no reason not to, not to believe it. But uh, he said that the FBI agents that were trained to recognize counterfeit money, they were, they were trained not to recognize all the fake money that might be out there in the world but they were trained to recognize the true currency. They spent years recognizing and looking and feeling of what real money feels like and looks like so that when fake money, counterfeit money comes into view, they recognize it. That's what Paul's teaching us. We should know the Word of God so well. That's why you're here today. That's why I'm teaching and preaching today. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have Bible study. Iron sharpens iron. We, we learn from one another for one reason, to know the truth. The truth will set you free, but the truth will recognize error. And that's what uh, this subject is all about, that we recognize error uh, that's in the world today, the Jewish, pe the Jewish people today. As much as I'm for Israel, as much as I want to promote Israel, certainly against all that they stand against, Islam. Israel today is just as guilty in their theology of as they were the day they crucified him. They, they said he's, he's a blasphemer. That's another one of those theological words about not adhering to, to true doctrine, that, that he's a blasphemer, that he says he's God and He's not God. He's not the Messiah. He's not the one of the Old Testament. And they hung him on a cross. Our Sunday school lesson today had that statement in it where Jesus said that the Son of Man would be crucified or he'd be, he'd be killed. But what happened on the third day? He rose from the dead. And for us to know the truth so well that any time we hear something in error, Islam is certainly not a uh, Christian believing group. They have their Koran. They go back to Abraham. They go back and he's their father. Jesus Christ is one of their greatest prophets. But he is not God in the flesh. He is not God. And here's why we have to watch out for, for these things. Dr. Larcia Hawkins was, was, and I thank God for that, was a tenured professor at Wheaton College. I got to uh, stroll through Wheaton College just out of Chicago, home of Billy Graham Museum. Great writers, great conservative church that many books have been written by their professors. Wheaton College. Tenured professor said, I stand in religious solidarity with Muslims because they, like me, a Christian, are people of the book. And as Pope Francis cited 
Last week, we worship the same God. I'm thankful some of you are shaking your head. Let's all of us shake our heads. That's heresy. That's saying that no matter, you can have all these different beliefs, but we don't all get to heaven because we're all serving the same God. The Muslims and the Jews and the Christians do all go back to Abraham, but boy, they do not all go back through Jesus Christ. And thankfully, even though a tenured professor, they let her go. And then the fact that she was a black woman, all the newspapers picked it up as racism. Again, that's why I hate that word. Gets thrown around and abused and used for everything. Well, what about just eras that we need to be aware of? There is a difference in era and heresy, the prosperity gospel. If you listen to radio or TV much, you probably hear all about the prosperity gospel. Do you see, remember how the New King, I mean the New Living translated that one verse? They just want your money. That's what Paul said 2,000 years ago. Some of the richest people in America are prosperity gospel preachers, millionaires, uh, because of, of the way they abuse the, the scriptures. The prosperity gospel teaches that if you just have faith enough, God's going to bless you with uh, good health and with wealth. And it's your fault if you don't have good health and wealth. The assemblies of God that teach that uh, speaking in tongues. And I can't stand here in in all honesty and and condemn everything about tongues because the Bible has a lot to say about tongues. We're going to get into that in our Sunday school uh, this next quarter in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. But when they teach that you have to speak in tongues in order to be a Christian, in order to have assurance of your salvation, then they're in error of what Paul was writing about because, and I'll, and I'll get back to that in just a minute, the, the Pentecostals, the, the Jimmy Swaggerts, that, oh, Jimmy can preach. If you've ever listened to him, he can get down and preach. Bishop, whatever, I can't think of Bishop uh, J.D. Jakes. Jakes. Kelly only knows him because I listen to him sometimes. You're talking about an old boy that can preach. Oh, T.J., J.D., something, Jakes can preach. But he's a prosperity gospel, and he believes you can lose your salvation. Jimmy Swaggart believes you can lose your salvation. Two of the things that I've dealt with uh, more than once in my ministry has been when Assemblies of God or a Pentecostal family wants to come uh, and join the church where, you know, I'm pastor, where the, the, a, a Baptist church. And the issue is we just can't. Come here if indeed you teach once saved, always saved, because our kids, this is what I've gotten, because our kids would go out and do whatever they wanted to do if they knew that they could never lose their salvation. We believe the Bible teaches you can lose it, and so that's a a reason for you better walk the straight and narrow or you don't go to hell. Well, that's an era of what Scripture is teaching. Not heresy, I don't think, but error. Well, certainly the homosexual issue with the Methodist church of late uh, is very anti-biblical, but it's not heresy, it's an error. Because heresy is going to take the main doctrines of Scripture, either the Trinity or the deity of Christ or the virgin birth of Christ, or the actual bodily resurrection of Christ, or the inerrancy of scriptures. One of those five things, the five tenets of our faith that we say you can't get wrong. You can get all these other things wrong and go to heaven. Paul said that if we we call on the... 10-10... Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead. What did it say? You might be saved. You will be saved. And so we can be wrong on 
We can be wrong on baptism. We can be wrong on the Lord's Supper. We can be wrong on everything. But these, these five tenets, the Trinity and the deity and the virgin birth and the, and the resurrection and the uh, uh, inerrancy of Scripture. Because if we're wrong on the inerrancy of Scripture, then we might be wrong on, on them other four main ones. That's really, so it's not, it's, not bibliolo- it's not worshiping the Bible. It's just knowing the Bible is the true word of God that's given us the, uh, the truth. And so how do we guard against heresy? And that's how I'll close this morning. And there's three things that, to me, jump out at me about this whole subject and the reason that I wanted to take a, a, a morning and talk about what Paul was saying. Church, watch out. That's what he said, present tense. Continually till he comes back again. You're going to have, as Peter said, you, you're going to have false teachers. There's going to be false doctrine out there that will lead you astray. I want you to know the truth of the Word of God. I want you to know who Christ is. And let me finish with what Paul said both to the Colossian church and then to the Philippian church. And Kelly's, I think, going to teach on beholding Jesus to the WMA ladies. This is what Paul said about beholding Jesus in the book of Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God. You've heard me say that before. He is the image of the invisible God. I think it was last week when I read the verse that said, No man has seen God at any time. What John said in John 1.18. But the Son has revealed him to us. Nobody's seen him because he's invisible, Paul says. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And I wrote a, a, a paper on this word pro, prototokos, firstborn, in seminary years ago. It doesn't mean like being born when you were non-existent. We were all non-existent before our birth. It's not being created or birthed. It's a word meaning rank. It was first in order. It's a ranking term. He was before there was ever a creation. And for by him, all things were created. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the importance of getting it right. And where apostasy can come in when we're talking about the attributes of Jesus himself. For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, through Jesus, and for him, for Jesus. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things have their glue together their consistency and in him all things hold together he's the head of the body the church he's the beginning the firstborn from the dead Lazarus was resuscitated he later died Jesus was resurrected he never died he is the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's why you can't dismiss Jesus. That's why you can't uh, go along with Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and many other religions that he's a good, he was a good person. He was a good prophet, teacher, a rabbi, but he was not God. He is the fullness of God. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. And here's the final nail in the coffin, making peace by
by the blood of his cross. Nothing and nobody can claim that. From the garden on, we're in enmity with God. And only one thing restores it. The blood of Jesus Christ as he died on the cross and subsequent resurrection. So we guard against heresy by just beholding Jesus. By just worshiping, by reading and learning again the inerrancy of scripture. And we read what God led these men to write. As Peter said, uh, we, didn't, we didn't write of ourselves, just get out here under a tree. We, were wrote as, we wrote as we were carried along, as God breathed the scriptures, the inspiration of scripture, the inerrancy of scripture, that we believe scripture to be true. But there's another thing that I want to point out about Garden Against Heresy, and that's what he writes to the Philippian church, Philippians 2.2. 2. Complete my joy, my, complete my joy by being of the same mind, not being divisive, that's what heresy comes from, but being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. That's the exact opposite of heresy. Heresy and division is when I want my way. That could be used of any division, but in our context today, it's with the division of not believing any, not believing the word of God, anything contrary to what Paul is teaching us. I want you to be of the same mind. I want you to love one another. Don't be ambitious, but rather submit to one another in love. And so as I put it all together, let me summarize with this statement. As we submit ourselves to the authority of God's word, there's first step, inspiration of Scripture. It's the authoritative Word of God. As we submit ourselves to the authority of God's Word, deal with one another in love and respect. We're submitting. That's the opposite of having get my way. We're submitting ourselves. To the authority of God's word. God's word's the authority. It's the truth. It's right. I'm submitting my will to that. I'm dealing with my brothers and sisters in love and respect. Are we don't always agree on every jot and tittle? Nothing in life are we don't always agree every jot and tittle. Me and my dad and brother, all three grew up in the same household, all Baptists, two preachers and a deacon, and we disagree on things. We are not all going to agree on everything. But we can in love, we can love one another and respect one another and lift up the name of Jesus. Those are the three things. We respect the authority of the Word of God. We respect one another and love one another. And we lift up the name of Jesus. And when we do that, divisions and heresies will certainly be diminished. And hopefully down the road as we mature, they are gone all together as we continue to mature in Christ. Let's bow our heads this morning.